Oh, hey, guys. How are y'all? So um, you, can, you can clap if you want. Um, <laughs> my name is Darren Sides. I'm an associate pastor here at Aspire Church. Uh, I tend to work behind the scenes in groups, uh, work with Next Gen, and work with missions. Uh, however, around holidays every year, you get the special privilege of hearing me preach. So every holiday season, like one holiday a year, I can guarantee you I am preaching. And um, I like to think of that because I'm a holiday special treat. Um, in reality, it's because I'm a supply preacher who's already paid by the church and can preach for Gary when he's on vacation. So it doesn't matter if you know that or not, uh, but my name is Darren, and I'm glad to be with you. Um, this weekend is a new holiday for me to preach on. I've never preached on this weekend. Anybody know what holiday it is? There you go. Um, I, I'm not going to ask how many of y'all didn't know there was a holiday this weekend, but Memorial Day is coming up uh, tomorrow, and um, if I ask you what Memorial Day is, uh, many of you may think that it's something military, but may not know what the true background of Memorial Day was. And truthfully, I didn't know that until I just started looking it up. And so this weekend is a day uh, where we focus specifically on, not just all vets, uh, but specifically focusing on people who died in service. And the roots of Memorial Day actually go all the way back to the Civil War. So at the Civil War, we had a whole lot of Americans who passed away um, during the war. And so national cemeteries were made, for, particularly for those Americans who died in the Civil War. And shortly after the Civil War, families would go out at the end of spring, the beginning of summer, and they would decorate all of the graves that were inside of these cemeteries. And so it became known as Decoration Day. And for almost 100 years, it was Decoration Day. And it was just a day in May, uh, May 30th, where we would recognize and see how things would go and recognize those who had fallen. Um, and take care of the cemeteries that existed. And then finally, in 1970, it was made into a federal holidays in the 1970s, and it now becomes known as Memorial Day. But Memorial Day isn't something that we need, you know, national government um, to let us know about. In fact, memorials are something that speak deeply into the human spirit. Like, there's something very deep within us that desires to have memorials, to recognize, to grieve, and to, to remember the oldest known memorial um, dates all the way back to about 3000 BC, and it's a memorial mound in the Middle East where a whole bunch of bodies were taken uh, within this country and placed and buried um, in this huge mound right outside of the city. And it was a recognition of some sort of war memorial. That's what we know. And what's crazy about that is to think that, like, Jesus' death, or if you don't want to go religious, like Caesar, okay? Caesar was closer to the iPhone than the very first memorial that was ever created, like war memorial ever created. That's insane to think of how old the need for memorials, how deep that need for memorials exists within us as people. We strongly desire to, to understand and to wrestle with the reality that we see. And so this morning we're going to investigate this idea of memorials. And we're going to do this by looking at one of the first memorials that were created when the Israelites came in to the promised land. So the story occurs about 1400 BC, and we're going to look at that. Um, it's coming out of Joshua 4. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll start looking at Joshua 4. Let's pray. God, I thank you for who you are. Lord, I pray for all of us in this room. I pray for uh, the things that have brought us to be in this room. Lord, the tragedies, Lord, the good things in our life, the successes. Um, Lord, I thank you for the things we don't even recognize that brought us into this room and gave us the freedoms that we have. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are in control of all things, and help us to think through that as we go through this message and as we go through this weekend. I praise things in your name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to set the stage for you for what's going on in Joshua 4. So Joshua 4, um, what happens is there were 400 years where this people group, the Israelites, were moved from the land of Canaan and into this little-known place called Egypt. And so they all came over because uh, one of the people that was part of this people group was the prime minister and kind of set up a way for these people to come into Egypt and to live there. Now, 400 years passed, and this people group ended up becoming um, downtrodden and kind of down the social hierarchy of things, right? And so if you've ever seen Carlton Heston, Ten Commandments, or uh, I was corrected, it's not a Disney movie, it is a DreamWorks movie, The Prince of Egypt. Um, and if you've ever seen that, right, it dictates how this people group, the Israelites, ended up leaving Egypt, going through the Red Sea, and God does this miracle through it. 
He does miracles through the plagues to actually allow the Israelites to leave and for Pharaoh to let him go. And then he does this miracle at the Red Sea to actually part it and to let the people of Israel walk across on dry land and get away from the Egyptians that were chasing them. So that's 400 years of history. And then immediately before this story in Joshua, we have 40 years of history. And these same people who left the land of Egypt are wandering through a wilderness or just this area in the Middle East for 40 years. And so they're going out and they're just crossing um, through the wilderness, meandering their way, trying to get to the promised land that God had done. And immediately before this story, what we have is they're at the foothills of uh, the promised land. They're finally at the land of Canaan, and all that separates them is the river, and it's the River Jordan. And so what happens is the Ark of the Covenant ends up going in, and it's this kind of place where God resided um, for the nation of Israel, went into the water of the Jordan. And what happens is, again, just like at the Red Sea, the, uh, the actual river kind of stops, and then the people are allowed to cross over. And the people have crossed over as we join them in the middle of this story. The entire nation had crossed over. And what's left in the water is the Ark of the Covenant holding back the waters and holding back the sea. And that's where you get into Joshua 4, verse 1. And I'll read it to you. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from where the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. So Joshua ends up doing this. He gets the men to pick up the stones. And if you jump down to verse 19, uh, you pick up with what happens just a little bit later in that day. Verse 19. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. So that all the the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So can you imagine the excitement that's going on with the Israelites as now they're seeing the culmination of 440 years of history? These people have been destitute. They've been enslaved almost. They've been put um, down, and then they've just wandered around a wilderness for 440 years. They haven't been home. There are beaten, war-torn, tired people that are finally arrived. And better yet, these people were home in an incredible act, right? Something that you and I have never seen, okay? If somehow the St. John's River just stopped flowing, we would think that's weird. Um, I don't know if you would, but I would think that's weird. And so, um, and so if that just stopped flowing, something happened. And so they're excited by the fact that God just did something and let them walk over into this land in a miraculous way. Yet in this moment of celebration, God had them stop, right? Many times we get to moments of celebration, and then we just go buck wild, right? And so you just get to a place, and you just, you just let loose, and you go. But that's not what God had them do. There was a moment of celebration, and the first thing God wanted them to do was to stop and to create a memorial. Why? Look back at verse 21. For when your children ask their fathers in times to come, God made the whole nation stop and set up a memorial because God knows something about the human heart. God wanted to set up a memorial because memorials align us. Memorials align us. And this is the first point if you're taking notes on the back of the worship guide, but it's incredibly important. You know, verse 21, you can see that the memorial was intended to align the hearts of the children of Israel, to let the children know what God did because they didn't experience it. And so to let them fully understand exactly what God did. But I don't think verse 21 is only talking about a benefit to the children. See, it's also a benefit to the fathers. There's interplay going on here between children and fathers. When the children ask their fathers in time to come. 
See, it's also a reminder to align the hearts of the fathers back to who God is, just as much as it's about aligning the hearts of the children to who God was. Memorials exist because we have a human problem of drifting, and we need things to ground us, to take us out of maybe whatever that momentary issue is that's creeping up, and to ground us into something that's more important. We need something to align us because we forget and then we drift into areas of danger. And Joshua knew this better than most others who were gathered around him. See, Joshua saw firsthand the pain that comes from drifting. Joshua was one of only two people who actually left the land of Egypt. Two people, tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand people left the land of Egypt. And Joshua is one of only two people who left the land of of Egypt that were still alive. He saw his parents, he saw his grandparents, he saw his whole generation die in a wilderness. Even though God had liberated his people out of the land of Egypt at the Red Sea, they still drifted right after and ended up passing away. Shortly after leaving the land of Egypt, the people quickly began and longed to go back to Egypt. They forgot about all of the life with their taskmasters and then they just desired to go back to the comforts of what was home. And so they went, and, and they just continued to long. And even Joshua, there's a story where Joshua was sent with 12 total people to go investigate the land of Canaan. Remember, God helped defeat the entire army of the Egyptians. And shortly after, these 12 guys go over into the land of Canaan, and they're determined, 10 of them determined, that they couldn't take it. That even though God could defeat the Egyptians, God couldn't protect them when they got into the land. And Joshua, his, Moses was meant, was, his mentor was Moses. And even his mentor Moses, who was the guy standing at the Red Sea, ended up mistrusting God's ability to provide. Mistrusted God's ability to time and to control the situation and take care of the Israelites. And he, too, drifted at that point in time. All of this drift and doubt came at a price. And if we ever think that our own drifting doesn't come at a price, we're foolish. The entire, the entire generations of the Israelites that left the land of Egypt were lost in the wilderness and the sands of the Middle East, never encountering that which they so longed for. You know, although this is a story of a people from 3,400 years ago, maybe this actually describes you today. Because the Bible is more than just a history book. It tells the history of peoples. But it actually does more than that. It describes the human condition. And as humans, we drift. And maybe you have been drifting. Maybe you've been drifting through just a series of troubles and times. And you need something to help ground you. And that's the point of memorials. They align our hearts. And who knows, maybe it's not just you drifting. Maybe you come from a family of drifters who are just riding the waves as life, one problem of life comes up and another problem goes up too. You just go from one thing to another thing, continuing to drift. And let me tell you, there is danger in drifting. And so this message of memorial isn't just about the danger that exists, but it's about the hope that God intends for us to know there is a danger there that's common to all men, but that memorials are set up as a way to help guide us towards something. So memorials align our hearts, but the rest of that statement is that memorials align our hearts to something greater than ourselves. It's not just that memorials remind us of a person or even memorials remind us of us. They're actually reminding us of something that's far deeper, far greater than any individual person. We memorialize moments, figures, events that remind us of the human condition and the nature of the world. So an example of this this week, I took my three-year-old son, we went to MOSH, uh, the Museum of Science and History, because right? they have a dinosaur thing, and I thought, oh, Caleb loves dinosaurs, so he's going to have fun, right? Um, and then I go there, and, um, and it's cool because it's the four, first like animatronic like dinosaurs with feathers that I've ever seen. Uh, I didn't know that you knew that but, like, dinosaurs had feathers now, and so it's not like just Jurassic Park running around. And so um, these dinosaurs with feathers are there, and then like, my son is convinced that they're absolutely real. And so, like, I try to show him they're not real by sticking my hand in their mouth, um, but I don't know that that may have caused more problems, actually. Um, 
but anyway, as we're going through Mosh, I'm going to go check out the rest of Mosh. And, um, and in the Museum of Science and History, there's actually like this exhibit that is um, a monument or a memorial to, what Jackson, to Jacksonville. And inside of this exhibit of Jacksonville, there stands one memorial um, that represents the 1901 fire. So I don't know if you all know this, but once upon a time, Jacksonville burned down. Um, and I didn't realize how bad it was. So, um, so this is actually the third largest urban fire ever in the history of the United States. And this memorial exists, right? And it's, it's not just an exhibit that's just talking about a fire. Because if it was just about a fire, I think that we'd kind of move past it. Instead, there's a picture of downtown Jacksonville pre the fire in 1901, and then there's a picture of downtown Jacksonville post the fire, and it's just empty. There's like two trees, and it's just flat land. And really, what are we memorializing there isn't a fire. It's something else. We're memorializing the frailty of earthly possessions, the reality that it can all go up in no time in smoke. It's something deeper about the dangers of nature and the respect we have to give to it, and we're memorializing that, and that's something greater than ourselves. As a nation this past week, we memorialized and grieved with the families of Evalde. Because in a moment, we as a nation had to grieve the loss of the youngest among us. And we also had to grieve the reality of the depravity of man and just what man can do. And that memorial isn't just about the event. It's actually far deeper. Because it's something deeper about who we are as people. I told you Memorial Day has its roots in the Civil War. And that's a war that's memorialized as a nation in the Lincoln Memorial. And we could think that the Lincoln Memorial is just about a guy, Abraham Lincoln. But we're missing the actual surrounding circumstances of what's in that memorial. That memorial has the words of two of Lincoln's addresses etched into stone all around it. And it's the Gettysburg Address, and it's his second inaugural address. And it's written on the walls. And why? Why did we choose those things to put inside of that memorial? Because in those two addresses, Abraham Lincoln is addressing the sin of the human condition of slavery. And how it wasn't just the South, but it was the North and the South and all of humanity that really carries that weight. And that is something to memorialize for us to realize that it is greater than just a man, but it's actually common to all of us. Memorials help to align us to something greater than ourselves. And at the riverbanks on the Jordan, God was aligning his people to the reality that God is supreme and able to provide. That he can halt nature and that he can lead the captives free. And that our response to that otherness, that other ability that we don't possess, that holiness, should be appropriate fear and respect. The memorial at the riverbank, though, was only a signpost to a greater memorial. See, God just didn't show up and stop the rules of nature at one time in the Bible, but he does it over and over again. And the greatest miracles of all are seen with Jesus, and it's at his death, and it's at his resurrection. When God himself took on flesh and died on a cross for us, and then radically altered nature by somehow raising him from the dead. And so we celebrate this memorial through two acts, and it's baptism and communion. And so we have a picture of these two things um, that I'm going to put up. So um, I'm going to tell you, we're not smart enough to plan this ahead, and maybe we are, but we didn't. But um, Eddie said, hey, why don't you preach on memorials on Memorial Day? I said, okay. And I thought, man, it's cool because that's happening the week after we actually celebrate the two memorials, the two ordinances, the two things that Jesus actually told us we should do to remember him. And so at Beach Baptism, what we did was we were able to actually celebrate through baptism the death, burial, and resurrection of ourselves and these individuals um, at the beach. And then we were to immediately come up and we all partake um, in the Lord's Supper and communion and understanding Jesus' blood and body that were, that were poured out and given for us. And so these memorials are powerful statements. And just like with the children of Israel, they're not just powerful statements for those people who crossed the Jordan. And they're not just powerful statements for even the children themselves when they ask later. 
But if you've been baptized before in years gone past, or you've taken the Lord's Supper before, they're really continual reminders for you of the reality that you drift. And so where are you? Do you remember what God did in your life over the years? How do you continue to remind yourself through memorials or rituals of exactly who God is and what God does? And so I'm going to end today with a few practical questions. And these questions are designed to help you organize your memorials. Ideally, they're designed to help you realize what your life is really aligned towards. So we're all drifting somewhere or we're intentionally moving somewhere. We're all moving. And the question really is, what is your life aligned to? And so my advice to you is like, take a pen, open the back of the worship guide if you have one, and try to write some of these thoughts down as we go through it. So first question, what in your life aligns you to something greater than yourself? What in your life aligns you to something greater than yourself? So write these things down. These may be objects or family heirlooms reminding you of the idea of family. They may be treasured objects from a memory, maybe a wedding ring. These may be places of significance. So maybe it's a house or maybe it's a gravesite. Whatever or wherever it is that reminds you of things greater than yourself, whether it be family, love, joy, pain, struggle, sin, whatever it is that's greater than you, write it down for a second. The nation of Israel over time ended up creating memorials. The Ark of the Covenant was a memorial of what Moses did up on a mountain. The tabernacle is a memorial for who God was through the desert leading them. The temple was a memorial of where God existed for them, why they were a special people. The law existed as a place when they were exiled to remember who God was. The high places, too, were a memorial. And there were altars like this at Gilgal that were memorials for the people of Israel. And so what are your memorials? Now, in looking at this list, the next question is this. Do you have too many memorials? Over time, we all accumulate more and more memorials. Graduations occur, weddings occur, births occur, deaths occur, triumphs occur. And so we create these little trinkets or these memorial objects, people, memories that just grow over time. Moreover, the people who you begin associating your life with bring with them memorials. They bring with them objects. The culture around you gives you memorials. And the reality is is that more memorials is not better, especially if they're all at the same playing field. Because if everything is important, nothing is important. And if your life is nothing but a horde of memorials, then there's no mental or emotional space for God. Your life is cluttered with memorials that have now become idols. This was the very thing Israelites, whom we read about in Joshua 4, have to go through. Because as they walk through the land of Canaan, gradually taking over piece by piece, what ends up happening is they end up, they end up accommodating and going along with the memorials of the Canaanites. One of those was what I mentioned before, the high places. And so they end up actually worshiping God in the high places instead of where God told them that they needed to worship. Similar, we can start going down paths towards worshiping God through memorials and aligning our lives to that, but then they just become idols. And God had a simple message for the Israelites, tear them down. If you feel you have a life of anxiety, clutter, and distractions, keeping you from remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, then you have idols in your life. You need to leave today here and maybe tear down some of those high places and memorials that are distracting you and destroying your relationship with God. Because they're actually causing you to drift to something that's not supreme. Next question Do you attribute greatness to your memorials? Do you attribute greatness to your memorials? Eventually, these same Israelites who crossed 
over the Jordan would focus on God through a single memorial, and that was the temple. And although the temple was a place where they could encounter God, the people became in love with the temple and the religion more than the relationship with the living God that was there at the temple. The proximity and the recurring rituals of the religion became more important than the relationship with God. And my example of this is actually going to be like a super preachery thing. So I am the son of a preacher, so here you go. Um, so there's this story, this preacher story, of, um, of a guy who goes off to war, and he has a girlfriend back home. So every day he writes her a letter from the field. And every day he writes it and sends it in the mail. And every day she waits at the door for the postman to come to give her a letter of love. Finally, when the soldier came home, he found out that the girlfriend had left him for the postman. First service laughed at that more. Um, proximity can distract you. That's the point of this, right? Proximity can ultimately distract you. Has the proximity of your memorials made you attribute the greatness to the memorial instead of to God? This can easily creep into your worship of God. We become devoted to the memorials of what God has done and who God is through reading the Bible and singing songs. However, our love can quickly latch onto the medium of the message and not the person who's writing the love letter. Our relationship will eventually grow cold and shallow, and all we are left with is empty religion around a book and around your favorite Maverick City music song. You just latch on to your favorite hymn, and you latch on to what the Bible is, and you've actually missed the Trinity. And it's the biggest danger, is when we attribute greatness to the memorial instead of just letting the memorial align you to something greater. And the last question, and this may be the hardest and most difficult for you to answer, because it requires humility on your part. Do you love yourself in the memorial? Do you see and love yourself in the memorial? The, memor the purpose of a memorial is to align yourself to something greater than you. Still, the most dangerous thing that can happen is for people to begin to worship themselves in their memorials. And we've all seen this. And I'm not saying any of y'all have done this because I know this is higher than you guys. I know y'all are better than this. But there's a memorial that all of us celebrate. And I know all of us celebrate it because it's called a birthday. So all of us in this room have a birthday. And it's a memorial to something, right? But the idea of a birthday isn't just for everybody to love and to cherish you. I know that's a random thought, right? That, that the birthday is not just about how great you are in this world. In fact, that your first birthday, it wasn't really even about you. It was about something greater. It was about something greater of this new life coming into this family unit. A family unit that was God's first institution he ever created on earth. It was about something that was bigger than that. It was about love between a parent and a child. And yet over time, we end up making birthdays about myself. And about how everybody should just cherish me and love me. And at that point, we've missed it because all we see in the memorial is ourself. We don't see our family. We just see us. And this concept creeps into our spiritual birthdays as well because you try to remember back to that point when you encountered God. And you may talk all about you know, your feelings and your emotions and what you were doing back then and maybe even the sins that you were entangled in at that point. And it all becomes about you. And so often the very thing that gets missing from people's testimonies is, you know, Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. And we kind of sprinkle that in on top of what the story is, but we kind of missed it. Because your testimony is really the story of Jesus and how the story of Jesus is playing himself out inside of you. But we miss the whole cross and we miss the grave. And so we become like these Israelites in Joshua 4 who much later on, they become so in love with the law that was a memorial of who God was and what God did that they become so in love with the law that they see how they fulfill the law in and of themselves, how they live according to the law as best as they can. And these Israelites end up becoming the Pharisees that at that point in time, they're so focused on how they fulfill the law that they missed Jesus entirely. 
And so if you're simply seeing yourself in all of the memorials that you've listed about how great they are for you or how they remind you of something, and you've missed the something that's greater, which is ultimately God and what God's doing, then what will end up happening is when God moves in your life next, you will completely miss him. Are the memorials in your life aligning you to something greater? And specifically, are they aligning you to God? So on this memorial weekend, take account of your memorials and what they mean to you. Allow the memorials of your baptism and of communion to orient and align your life to something greater than yourself. Even align ideas like this memorial where people sacrifice their lives for the idea of freedom for all people to be free. And that that freedom also carries with it a freedom of belief and a freedom of choice. I'm not saying other memorials aren't good memorials, but how are the memorials in your life pointing you ultimately to God? Because if they're not, then you've missed it. So praise God this weekend over his birth, death, and resurrection. And how those things allow you to share in his life. How any memorial in your life should allow you to share in God's love. And who God is. And if the memorial can't do that, then maybe it's a memorial worth tearing down. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this group of believers. God, more importantly, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you for your ability just to help guide and direct our lives. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to convict us of places where we've established memorials to ourselves. Lord, give us the strength and the power to tear them down. Lord, I pray for an individual in this room who has never actually embraced you. Lord, they've never followed with you through the act of baptism or have embraced who you really were, and what your death, burial, and resurrection really was. Lord, that they can build a new memorial today of a relationship with you. Lord, I pray for the rest of us in this room who do believe in you. Lord, that you can help us never to grow stale, but help us to continue to come back to memorials that point us back to you. Help us to not let them become idols. But Lord, let your Holy Spirit use them in our lives and use them in the lives as we educate our children and those around us. I praise things in your name. Amen. All right. Uh, finally, to end everything, um, I just wanted to let you guys know in your worship guide, there is a tear-off portion. If you have any questions or anything you want to let us know, you can do that. Um, at that point in time, if you have any questions about VBS or anything else that Casey was saying at the very beginning of this, uh, feel free to write them there. And if you have any prayer requests, you can put them on the back. Uh, you guys can go ahead and stand up. And I will send us out. God, I pray for this church. I pray for us as we go out, Lord, that we can celebrate um, this Memorial Day with who you are and celebrate with the families and the people that are closest around us. Grace and peace be with you. Thanks, guys.